Track circuits is a fourth section of basic signaling principles and associated circuitry presentation. Apart from the AC double rail track circuit, the track circuit appears to be a very simple circuit, which, if in the bench mode, it is. But it's outside, it's on earth, and subject to varying weather conditions. The function of the track circuit is used in circuitry throughout signalling engineering, but predominantly to ensure the basic principle of ensuring only one train in any one section at a time. If you haven't seen the introduction video, and the video is covering the content of sections 1, 2 and 3, you can access these via the links in the description box below. Hello, I'm Roy Tomset, author of Basic Signaling Principles and Associated Circuitry Presentation. The basic track circuit principle may be simple, but variations of equipment and layout are required to cover track layout, straight track or points, and types of traction used, AC, DC or no traction. This section covers all of these variations and starts with the basic track circuit. As with all sections, a video presentation covers all of the learning material and an e-book provides this information in written format, in other words a workbook. The workbook also contains self-assessment questions and answers to, to check the progression made. If you're not already aware, this complete package comes at a very low cost and there is a bonus. I'll explain this later. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe below. Let's look at the content covered in this section. The basic DC track circuit is used to explain the characteristics of track circuits, starting with the variable resistor, used to vary current flow in the circuit, as well as acting as a load and preventing a short circuit across the power supply when the wheels and axles of a train short circuit the rails. The amount of current flowing through the relay determines the relay voltage. The higher the current flow, the higher the relay voltage. The relay voltage determines the amount of pressure on the relay contacts. The higher the relay voltage, the higher the compression on the contacts. Insulated rail joints completes the basics. Then it's onto ballast resistance. After explaining what it is and how it affects the characteristics of the track circuit, we show how weather conditions change the performance. Moving on to the drop shunt, this is explained in detail. Here is an example of a video showing how this is explained. The train shunt, commonly known as a drop shunt, is the most critical of all adjustments made to track circuits. When a train occupies the track circuit, the wheels and axles of the train cause the track circuit current to be shunted away from the relay, causing the relay to de-energise. The wheels and axles of the train, however, can never be relied upon to create a total short circuit, zero ohms. This has become even more apparent in recent years with the design of new types of train with wheels designed for lower rail contact or smoother travel. If anything less than a complete short circuit occurs, then some of the current can reach the relay. In the worst case scenario, enough current escaping could cause the relay to energise. Through, through research and development, there are proven acceptable levels for different types of track circuit and different types of trains that require signal engineers to carry out tests and procedures to ensure that track circuits will operate efficiently. The minimum acceptable resistance, but which when placed across the rails causes the relay to become de-energised, is the most important criteria to be followed when setting up a track circuit, and is called the minimum acceptable drop shunt. All other values, such as the relay voltage, rail voltage, resistance settings, etc., relate to the operating performance of the track circuit. The actual resistance 
which when placed across the rails at the relay end of the track circuit causes the track circuit to become de-energised is known as the drop shunt. The drop shunt is the most important value to be obtained in the commissioning and subsequent maintenance of any track circuit and overrides any other parameter. The drop shunt test is covered in detail, including the shunt box, how it is connected and how the test is carried out, and what adjustments need to be made if drop shunt is too low or too high. Having covered the characteristics of track circuits, we now cover the changes made due to varying weather conditions. We can see that in wet conditions, due to lower ballast resistance, the relay voltage drops, the compression of the contacts lowers and the drop shunt rises. The opposite happens in extreme dry conditions when the ballast resistance rises, the relay voltage increases, compression on the contact rises and the drop shunt decreases. We now look at track circuit bonding, showing examples of both parallel and series bonding. The reason for ensuring series bonding is used wherever possible is explained. Explanation is given to the use of trap points and the use of a track circuit interrupter to ensure track circuit is shown occupied even if the train becomes derailed and no shunt is present. The different traction systems are explained with particular emphasis on how traction return may be present in the running rails which could cause false energisation of track relays, a wrong side failure. Starting off with the DC third rail traction system, then the DC fourth rail traction system and then the AC overhead traction system. The terms single and double rail is explained in that they relate to how many rails are used to return traction current. We then cover the types of track circuits used in relation to traction systems in use starting with the simple DC track circuit used where no electric traction system is used. Moving on to AC overhead line traction systems we look at the DC track circuit AC immune and explain in detail how the relay used becomes AC immune. Where the DC traction system is in place, we cover the AC single rail track circuit, which is reasonably simple circuit. Unfortunately, in most areas, is only used through points and crossings. AC track circuits use a double element vane relay. Both coils need to be energized for the relay to pick. One coil, the local coil, is energized all the time with a control coil fed from the feed end through the rails to the relay end. This is the feed end that is diverted away from the control coil by the wheels and axles of a train occupying the track circuit. AC double rail track circuits allow not only the two running rails to be paralleled up but also the tracks to be paralleled up allowing as many traction return paths back to the substation. The AC double rail track circuit is used here and is far more complex. We go into detail how the impedance bond allows free flow of DC traction return to pass over the insulated rail joints, at the same time allowing the AC track circuit current to flow through the running rails as an AC path without being short circuited by the low resistance traction coil. Details of how equal amounts of traction current flowing through each running rail is important and how saturation can cause track circuit failures if there is an imbalance of current flow. A double millivolt meter is used to check for the imbalance. Finally, we show how the AC double rail track circuit can be divided into three sections. The step down feed circuit, the rail track circuit and the step up relay circuit. Then it's to the workbook for the self-assessment test. That is the content covered in section 4. The introduction and content video section 1 basic signaling principles, section 2 signaling diagrams, sketches and plans, section 3 basic signaling and lighting circuitry can be accessed via the links in the description box below. 
The remaining section, covering points, will detail the content shortly in a video like this. Five ebooks and five videos giving a firm foundation for learning railway signaling engineering for just £15 plus VAT. And then there is a bonus. You will also receive the ebook Assistant Tester, Mod 5, for free, which is downloadable when you purchase basic signaling principles and associated circuitry presentation. To purchase basic signaling principles and associated circuitry presentation, click the link in the description box below. It is payable via Visa, MasterCard or PayPal and access is then immediate. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe below and I hope to be in contact soon with more detail. Access to more information will also become available in Basic Signaling Principles and Associated Circuitry on Facebook and can be accessed via a link in the description box below.